Hi, everyone. My name is KJ Bogshi, and I am Senior Policy Counsel at the Open Technology Institute. I wanted to welcome everyone to this conversation today that centers on the role that algorithms play in our daily lives and in our society at large. I'll be trying to incorporate audience questions throughout the conversation today. So just as Angela had mentioned, and as a reminder to our listeners, please submit your questions via the Q&A and chat feature on Zoom. Uh, the comment feature via YouTube or by tweeting at OTI. Now to get us quickly on the same page, I wanted to make sure we're using a similar vocabulary. Algorithms that we'll be talking about today are a step-by-step -step set of directions coded to accomplish a specific task. Now there are many definitions of artificial intelligence and I'm sure our panelists have their own thoughts on this topic, but today we're using the term in a broad sense as a scientific field focused on designing systems using algorithmic techniques. Now, one specific subset of, of approaches to achieve artificial intelligence is machine learning, which uses algorithmic building blocks to achieve an outcome. Now, you may hear these three terms used interchangeably today, and it's only because they're in the same ecosystem that we're exploring. Today's discussion attempts to bridge the connection between two issues that are usually spoken about separately the issue of how algorithms are used in the era of big data and how they have a privacy intrusive manner and how the output of these algorithmic systems often have disparate impacts on communities of color and other marginalized groups. Now, I would be remiss if I hadn't acknowledge the backdrop of our conversation today. Across the country in the past few weeks, civil unrest has spread across the, uh, the nation as thousands protest against inequity and abuse of power. Today's conversation hits at the heart of the systems that are meant to be uplifting and restorative, and yet the technological designs that are created with the idea of establishing objectivity are reflecting the same inequities that we have in our society. One of the questions around these issues that we're exploring today is who should be accountable and what mechanisms can we employ to identify privacy intrusive algorithms or algorithmic bias. We are very fortunate today to have a keynote speaker has worked on these issues in her role as vice chair of the House Energy and Commerce Committee while she represents New York's 9th Congressional District. She's also introduced the House version of the Algorithmic Accountability Act of 2019 that proposes an oversight framework of automated systems to ensure that large companies and other beneficiaries of algorithmic design do not turn a blind eye towards unintended impact. I'll hand it over to her now to provide her remarks. Congresswoman. Let me first of all, thank you, KJ, and thank uh, ATI for inviting me to participate in today's critical discussion. Thank you for the kind introduction, and I thank uh, the New America for hosting today's panel on such a critical topic. Increasingly, algorithms instead of people help determine whether Americans are hired for a dream job, approved for a home mortgage, or sent to prison or jail. However, algorithms can be dangerously biased and result in discriminatory decisions. While AI systems come to, uh, con to conclusions based on calculations, the outputs can reflect the biases of the programmers or the data sets used to train the systems. That's why last year I introduced the Algorithmic Accountability Act the first ever bill to directly address this challenge. Under my legislation, the FTC would be required, will require companies with data on over 1 million users or revenue greater than $50 million to conduct bias and security assessments of highly sensitive automated decision systems and then fix any issues they identify. Right now, we have an incentive structure for that that rewards willful blindness. If companies don't audit their algorithms for bias, they can act surprised when a researcher discovers that their software is perpetuating discrimination. But under my bill, the incentives are flipped. If you aren't undertaking due diligence to make sure your systems are fair, you, you're not just at risk of receiving a bad headline, you are liable under law. As our country grapples 
with two simultaneous pandemics, the health pandemic of COVID-19 and the societal pandemic of police brutality, algorithmic accountability may not seem like it's a priority, but it's mis that's mistaken because AI bias is inherently linked with these two crises. Last month, I led a letter with Senator Wyden advocating that the next coronavirus relief package require recipients of federal stimulus funding to audit their automated decision-making systems for bias. This is critical because AI is particularly disturbing in the context of our healthcare system. AI will play a key role in monitoring the spread of COVID-19 among individuals, predicting future outbreaks and perhaps even allocating scarce healthcare resources. Already, algorithms are being used to identify high-risk patients. If the pandemic intensifies, the hospitals and hospitals, excuse me, experience shortages of ventilators or other supplies, these algorithms could be used to prioritize care. That sounds great in theory, but in practice, there are existing examples of biased AI resulting in patients of color, black patients in particular, receiving less care than their white patient counterparts. Life and death decisions should not be informed by algorithms unless we have confidence that they are putting people of that, that they are not putting people of color at risk. Confronting AI bias is also critical in the context of our economic response to the coronavirus. For example, with companies receiving so many job applications right now, many are turning to automated systems to sort through resumes. It may sound fair to program the algorithm to look for resume, resumes that share similarities with the with the resumes of people who have previously been hired by the company, but in reality, because those previous hiring decisions may themselves be biased, favoring privileged applicants over poorer applicants and stacked against women who may uh, have taken time away from the workforce, the new algorithm is going to perpetuate those biases. With our country facing the highest unemployment rate since the Great Depression and small businesses desperately seeking capital, preventing automated discrimination in employment and lending is absolutely essential. Finally, I'd like to say a few words about how IA, excuse me, AI bias is increasingly perpetuating discrimination in the criminal justice system. Right now, people across America are standing up and speaking out about the systemic racism and police brutality that has led to the death of countless African Americans and the beating, abuse, and incarceration of so many more. George Floyd was murdered while a camera was rolling. But we know so many other people have suffered the same injustice when a camera wasn't there. So what would you say if I told you that historical data from the criminal justice system, the same system that jails, stops, searches, and convicts African Americans at much higher rates than any other group is now being used to create algorithms to decide who will post bail, how much that bail costs, and recommend the length of prison sentences to judges. It's happening in states around the country. Using raw data, from a broken criminal justice system to assign risk scores is certain to lead to unjust outcomes. Machine learning algorithms and use statistics, excuse me, machine learning algorithms use statistics to find patterns in data. If you feed the system historical crime data, that, that data, excuse me, It will pick out the patterns associated with convictions. Maybe it'll save defendants from a particular neighborhood or more likely to return to prison. 
And what the raw data doesn't show is the way is is that the reason why more people return to prison from that neighborhood is not because of more crimes, that more crimes are occurring, but because it's over police and even minor infractions in that neighborhood are likely to be caught and result in parole violations. Maybe it's because people from that neighborhood are more likely to be convicted by biased juries. These, there are endless other examples of how biased AI impacts real people's lives and harms people of color and women in particular. The bad news is that unless we act soon, Given the rapid deployment of AI, many of these biases will become even more deeply entrenched in our society, baked in to these formulations, if you will. However, the good news is that this problem has a solution. With better data sets, continuous auditing, both before an algorithm is released and after it's operational, and increased diversity throughout the technology ecosystem, we can successfully mitigate algorithmic bias. So I wanna thank you for having me for this very stimulating conversation today. And thank you for the opportunity to, be, to participate. And KJ, I, I, I yield to you. I appreciate that, Congresswoman. Thank you so much for those really important remarks. Uh, I want to now welcome our panelists to join the webinar. I'll let each panelist go a little more into the work that they do, but I do want to introduce them by name and by organization. I'm excited to welcome our panelists, including Daniel Kahn Gilmore, who is a senior staff technologist at the ACLU Speech, Privacy, and Technology Project, Iris Palmer, who is a senior advisor for higher education and workforce with the Education Policy Program at New America and Antoine Prince Albert III, who is the Technology and Telecommunications Fellow at the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. I should note that Prince is subbing in for Sakira Cook, who was unable to participate today given her need to focus on supporting communities and community leaders dealing with the uh, civil unrest across the country. I wanna start off our discussion today by talking about a recruiting tool that was designed by Amazon but shut down before they could widely use it. The company created a program in 2014 that would review a pool of resumes and identify the top candidates. Now by 2015, the company realized its new system was not rating candidates for software developer jobs and other technical posts in a gender neutral way. And that's because Amazon's computer models were trained to vet applicants by observing patterns in resumes submitted to the company over a 10 year period. So it's a lot of data. Most came from men, a reflection of male dominance across the tech industry. Now keep in mind the training data had all direct representations of gender removed. However, some found a way to make inferences and reflect the biased preferences of the tech industry as a whole. Now I wanna bring in Daniel now to lay some foundation for us on some of the issues highlighted by the story that was reported a year or so ago. Daniel, what does Amazon's story tell us about the demand for creating automated systems in the tech sector? And what are the implications, if any, on the privacy of users engaging with tech products? And also, what are the implications for systems still creating bias output, even if the training data used is trying to be quote unquote neutral? Uh, those are it's a, a pack of good questions and I'm happy to be <laughs> in the conversation here today. Um, so the story with Amazon, with that particular uh, training set, there's a bunch of other examples as well, but the story there is really a reminder that, um, uh, first off, I think it's a reminder that these systems are designed primarily as cost shifting measures. Uh, those are, the systems are um, designed to make it possible to do things at a scale that your traditional mechanisms wouldn't be able to do, and the result is that they tend to cut corners. Um, the training data that comes uh, that comes in here, I mean, as you described, Amazon had removed explicit markers for gender, um, but we know that there are lots of data features that are sort of proxy measures um, for categories that we would care about. Um, and the uh, so the system is able to pick up on those proxy measures. And if the way that the system is applied is to try to say, well, let's see who does well at our company, if the answer is, the answer could very well be that men do better at Amazon than women. 
right? And the, re the reason for that may be, there may be a number of reasons, right? There may be an ingrained culture of sexism within the Amazon workforce, which drives women out of the workforce. And so if you simply, if you blindly say, well, we want to make sure we hire people who do well at our company, and the reason some people aren't doing well at your company is an internally discriminatory regime, the systems will pick that up um, if they have enough data, and they will apply that data, and they'll tell you, hey, you shouldn't hire this woman. She's not going to be a good fit here because your sexist coworkers are going to drive it out. Except, of course, the systems won't say that last part. They'll simply say, um, here are the people who are going to do well under the regime that you have. Um, so I think it points to a couple of things. One is it points to this question of um, where are the costs being shifted from um, and why do we need these cost shiftings to happen? Um, and two, um, uh, who bears the brunt of the decisions that these things make? You could use the same system to look internally at the policies of a group like Amazon and say, hey, it looks to me like we're losing a large percentage of potentially good workers. Um, why don't we shift the corporate culture so that we can make sure that we retain, you know, these kind of employees? Um, but the, the systems are being designed not to do that. They're being designed to say, well, let's just, let, let's answer the easy question. That's going to do as well um, internally. Now, to Amazon's credit, they killed that system before it, it became live, but there are many other systems that are out there that suffer from the same thing. Um, with the ACLU, we did a, a test of Amazon's facial recognition system of matching uh, people against a mugshot database. And we used it, we used, um, colleagues of mine used the uh, headshots of the members of Congress and said, hey, like, let's match these against this mugshot database. How many of these folks have prior convictions? And of course, the mugshot database doesn't generally include the sorts of convictions you might expect members of Congress to have. Um, rather, it represents, as Representative Clark mentioned, um, the decades of um, or centuries of racist policing. And as a result, the people of color in Congress were misidentified as felons from this mugshot database at a much higher percentage than the, um, than the white folks in Congress. So I think, you know, again, if you were to use this to say, like, let's learn something about the underlying system and think about how we can use it to apply systemic reform, these tools might be useful. Um, but the discriminatory impact comes when you apply these systems as um, with individualized consequences. No, it's helpful. I appreciate the, the context there. So, I mean, I want to bring in Iris to talk about some of the issues you're seeing in the higher education field around this rush to create automated systems with troves of data. Yeah, higher education is using these uh, in, a, in a couple ways, and they're very similar, actually, to some of the ways that Daniel identified with slightly less horrible consequences, perhaps, we could argue. Um, so colleges use these things to um, choose who to enroll and admit in their schools. They use algorithms to, um, some of them use algorithms to identify people who are at risk of dropping out of college and try to intervene early, keep them on track. Uh, and they also can use them to help people um, choose their like course of study and the type of major they want to take. And um, while I think obviously the risks in the criminal justice system and housing and a lot of other areas might seem a little bit more um, extreme. I will say that there are some issues with this if they're not used carefully, it's similar to the way Daniel was talking about. Um, so you can perpetuate um, inequality, racist inequality that is um, the access to higher education just in perpetuity. So similar to hiring, um, colleges look at different applicants for fit and who's going to fit and succeed at our institution. And if you uh, embed that into the algorithm itself, you can perpetuate um, the inequality in higher education and the access and success in higher education. Uh, there is also a risk of tracking students. So we talked to someone in our research who um, had spoken to a Latina student who was interested in going into a STEM major. She uh, was told by her professor that the algorithm said that she wouldn't be successful in that major and she should not go into it. And so using these algorithms to systematically um, bring people who traditionally were not successful in certain high um, status and lucrative majors and putting them into different majors or getting them to take different kinds of courses. Um, there's also an idea that this um, can facilitate profiling, similar to the way Daniel was talking about, but also just um, in general, uh, we've heard about systems where all they tell you is who is a person of color on your campus and who has like a low S, like who has a lower socioeconomic status when they enter college. 
If that's all this algorithm is telling you, that is not a useful algorithm. It just perpetuates bias. Um, and then obviously there's security and privacy violation issues. So if you're not transparent about how the data, how student data is being used in these systems and what are being used for, um, then they can be a real issue. No, that's, that's, that's helpful context in this conversation. And then to sort of round out are sort of illustrating the, the issues that we're talking about. Prince, you know, we're living in a moment right now of nationwide unrest as individuals protest the treatment of black lives because of a deep rooted belief that our institutions are abusing their positions of power and influence. Many individuals as a result will engage with the criminal justice system, a, a system that uses automated systems to track individuals or produce recommendations around sentencing and parole. What are some of the concerns that are coming to your mind when we think about the role of algorithms in the criminal justice system? Sure, thank you, KJ. And um, as you kind of highlighted, before I go on to talk about the concerns, I really do want to acknowledge this watershed moment in Black life in the United States and abroad. And I want to put the technologies we're talking about here today in dialogue with our national frustration about systemic racism. So just quickly in memory for those who have been killed or irreparably altered by racism, as uh, Representative Clark mentioned, I just ask for nine seconds of silence. Thank you. Now I wanna lay out the technologies most prevalent in the criminal legal system, those that the leadership conference has lobbied around and uh, educated people about. So I'll mention four, but for the remainder of this discussion, I really wanna drill down on two that really um, highlight the, the inequities and in our concerns. So the four are risk assessment tools, uh, facial recognition technology, predictive policing systems, and body-worn cameras. Uh, and I'll primarily be talking about risk assessment tools and, and facial recognition today. Risk assessment tools or risk assessment instruments, RITs, RIIs, they are actual actuarial instruments that estimate the likelihood of a defendant's rate of recidivism or failure to appear before the tribunal. Uh, or uh, their likelihood of being rearrested on a similar or more violent crime in the future. And the score is a function of uh, frequency of interactions among, uh, of infractions rather, among similarly situated defendants. It, these systems rely on a stock of defendant samples, if you will, uh, that has trained the, the tools to emit certain outcomes for certain kinds of people. Factors they consider are substance abuse, criminal history, failure to appear before court, um, employment stability, education level, housing, residential stability, family peer relationships, community ties, and others. Those are some of the common ones around the number of about 36 different systems we see being used throughout the United States. And they can be used at really any juncture of the criminal legal process where um, critical decisions are made of freedom, right? We can see it at the pretrial system, re sometimes replacing bail or augmenting bail decisions. These algorithms can be used. Uh, we see them in consideration for early release from a sentence or post-conviction stages while formerly incarcerated persons are on probation or on parole. And in this respect, the risk assessment tools are not really predictive at all because they do not use any artificial intelligence, machine learning, or any progressive self-learning technologies that you mentioned earlier. Risk assessment tools are merely like calculators more than smart technologies. And some of the concerns we see around risk assessment tools are that they uh, use historically discriminatory data sets Scores are not individualized to a person, rather they project the generalized assumptions about recidivism from a group of similarly situated demographics onto this one person. Um, and we believe they do run afoul of constitutional protections. 
tools are rarely used to identify needs, though they say they're used to identify needs. They're really mostly used to make liberty decisions. And we fear that sometimes they supplant or replace uh, a judge's independent decision making. We don't know how in many instances and can't know how these tools work. Both companies and governments block disclosure under respective theories of trade secrets or security classification. And uh, both individual and the public are denied due process, right? A tool that is making a liberty decision about people um, should be available to the defendants. They should know how that tool works. They should know the factors that are going in, how frequently that tool is, is audited, how reliable it is. And so they can challenge those decisions. Um, and lastly, before I turn it over, just facial recognition, right? This technology, records measurements between structures and markings of the face to save them as a unique profile of that face for either one-to-one -one verification, like your cell phone, or your cell phone is using um, a stored image of your face to verify yes or no, the person holding up the phone is you, or one-to-many identification, right? Um, and this is the particular law enforcement use taking a photo that they find from either a mugshot or uh, an image uh, used on a recording camera and running it through a system of names. And this is what DKG was talking about with the ACLU's study of members of Congress um, and trying to find if that one person is found in the system. And this is really important because right now, right, protesters are being intimidated from exercising their First Amendment rights to assemble and to speak freely with the deployment of these technologies. Law enforcement and white supremacist hate groups are using even access to social media and facial recognition technologies to identify protesters, to dox them or otherwise target them. And our biggest fear here is that uh, there are inaccuracies in facial recognition. Facial recognition is known to inaccurately identify people who are not white, not male, and not gender static in particular. And this could bring real harms for misidentifying the wrong persons. No, that's helpful. And I wanted to drill down a little bit on, on facial recognition and the, the use of algorithms and, and AI. In, I think we've sort of acknowledged a little bit, and I talked about in the beginning that story about Amazon sort of rushing to create this system. Uh, I believe the term that Daniel talked about was sort of it's cost shifting, right? It's it's cheaper to use these systems instead of, you know, essentially getting human beings to review this massive amount of data. So, but is there a concern with, and I'm thinking about the story, the news story that came out where a company was essentially to try, they were trying to perfect their facial recognition technology and they essentially took pictures of homeless folks. Um, and they had contractors, right, go out and take pictures without really any real consent. And so this was definitely a very pr privacy invasive um, sort of attribute for, you know, for Prince or, or Daniel or I guess, you know, Iris in the education field. I mean, is there a concern with just establishing the training data to make these algorithms and sort of being privacy invasive there, is that a concern? I think it's a concern. I mean, we see, um, you know, these systems are designed, particularly the ones that are based on large statistical models, uh, they only work if you have access to large amounts of data. So just the presence of these systems um, drives a, um, a hunger for large data sets. Uh, now, there are some ways you can assemble large data sets that are uh, not as bad for the people who are in the data sets, but sometimes when you have a large data set, if you don't manage it well, it becomes uh, an attractive nuisance. Uh, and that could be like a problem for law enforcement or immigration services or for foreign hackers or for identity thieves or, or whatever, right? If the data is not well managed. We've seen instances of that with just, for example, not even talking about machine learning here, but uh, OPM, the uh, Office of Personnel Management, had a System, a system that collected all the um, information they had on doing background checks over decades and it was compromised. They hadn't been doing adequate data uh, destruction. Um, and so if you build a large data set in order to feed these systems because you want them to be better um, and you don't think consciously about how you maintain that data, um, 
that's a potential privacy risk for the people whose information is stored there. Um, I want to also point out that many of these, these uh, systems are developed for commercial purposes, right? Like they want to predict who's going to buy a certain pair of shoes or who's going to want to uh, buy a car or who's a good, a good match for this particular restaurant. Um, and again, these systems are being sold to the advertisers as saying, we're going to find you the people who are going to be your customers. Um, and so there's an entire economy around building these data sets about people that are, that, that's marketed towards salesmanship um, that also has discriminatory impact. Imagine if uh, you have an algorithm that's trying to decide whether to show an ad for uh, new homes. And if it decides that it only wants to show new homes to people who have historically been known to buy homes and the models have the exact same sorts of racial markers that we're, that we're talking about, proxies for racial characteristics, whether that's zip code um, or education level or family members who've had contact with the, um, with the carceral system or anything like that. Um, again, those algorithms may well filter out and do a sort of digital redlining. Um, and this is happening entirely in the private sector, right? Uh, and still having these impacts. And so you have this, this pressure from the algorithms for large data sets on the one side, that's a privacy risk because the data sets are a risk. And then on the other side, you have this um, more ways that your information can be misused because these same systems um, uh, have an impact on people's lives as the information gets pulled in. So, you know, in addition to losing, uh, you know, people losing control of their data, people are also impacted more closely by the fact that their data is out there because these systems are making decisions on their behalf. And so in some cases by people who have no malicious intent, but they simply are creating systems that have this impact. Um, which is one reason why ensuring that we have clear visibility into what these tools actually do um, is important, right? That's it's step zero for sure. Just knowing that these systems are discriminatory is insufficient for us to protect the population and uh, you know ourselves from their from their impact. Um, what they do, they, it's very difficult for us to figure out how we can address the um, the inequalities and how we can find the privacy violations and ways people are being harmed by them. No, that's helpful. And so I, I want to incorporate an audience question here. Um, and the question is, as this comes from someone who works in information security and they have concerns about the integrity of the systems that we're talking about. And, you know, and I'll, I'll pose this to Daniel, um, then I'll open it up to others. But could you speak to the dangers of a, of a hacker being able to tweak certain data points to force a less than pleasant outcome? Uh, I mean, there's a bunch of different ways. We, we call this adversarial modeling. Um, so, uh, if you're, so, so Prince describes some of these risk assessment tools as just being calculators, not smart tech. Um, and I, I think I see the distinction there, although I actually think that smart tech is basically some fancy calculators as well. Um, the, di the difference I would characterize it is a calculator is something where you can actually see everything that's connected and what's going on in it, right? So you can say, hey, look, this is just a spreadsheet and it says, do you have parents who've been arrested before? And if you say yes, then that makes you twice as likely for us to just hold you in jail anyway. That seems like kind of a messed up outcome. You can inspect it, you can see the path for the messed up outcome. The smart tech is really obscure tech, right? It's systems that where the calculators have become so complicated that it's difficult for anyone, even the designers of the system, to pull it apart and say, here's why this particular decision was made. And so if, once you get into this opaque tech system, um, it becomes very challenging to figure out uh, whether something has gone wrong. And furthermore, you can get folks who push that opaque tech system into um, a really problematic space, right? We, I don't know if you've seen these, these researchers who figured out stickers that if you slap the sticker on anything, then the standard machine learning algorithms think it's a banana. Doesn't matter what it is, this is a banana sticker, right? You put it on and the machine learning algorithm thinks it's a banana. Why does it think it's a banana? We don't really know, right? The system is a complicated one. Nobody can pull it apart well enough to understand it. But hey, this is a banana sticker. And if any object you put it on, the machine will think it's a banana. And you could imagine somebody tweaking a system either by um, salting the training data with bad stuff or perhaps by getting into the model and actually fiddling with parameters, you know, training their own model, getting parameters that they like, and then going and substituting that in an attack that people don't somehow notice. Um, 
and causing all kinds of mayhem on that, right? Uh, so, so the more that we can understand these systems, the better we can defend ourselves against them. And I want to point out that the, you know, having that kind of review, this is not a theoretical concern, right? This is a, these systems are, um, they're basically like, let's throw a bunch of data at this and turn a crank and the machine Gene will give us an answer and we don't have to think about what's going on inside that. Um, that attitude might be useful for like saying, let's generate some hypotheses that we then want to test in the world. But if you say, well, let's just, let's just apply this to, you know, say a security system to figure out whether someone's um, access to the bank is a legitimate access to the bank. And I can manipulate that. I could lock people out of their bank accounts, right? I could lock people out of their ability to access um, civic technology. What if I made it so you simply couldn't talk to your representative anymore because their, you know, machine learned model of what is a, um, you know, what is a hacker trying to get into the, um, trying to get into the web forum that you talk with your representative on just excluded my neighborhood, right? Um, so these are the sorts of things where these systems have real impacts and the more that we treat them as black boxes, the more that we say, hey, we trained it up on a bunch of data and it's probably fine the more we are opening ourselves to manipulation of those systems. So I want, I want to double down on this conversation about the, you know, like data security and IRS and, and just want to get your sort of thoughts when we're thinking about education systems. I mean, they're collecting a lot of information on individuals as they enter these institutions. And a lot of, again, as Daniel talked about, a lot of these automated systems require that those troves of data to be able to make decisions quickly. So what are the concerns from the education perspective on that sort of data security and how it can violate privacy? Yeah, so there is an actual federal law called FERPA that governs educational data privacy. Um, that being said, I don't believe it's ever or is very rarely enforced uh, in any way. So while it's used a lot in conversation, it's actual um, impact is mixed, I would say. Uh, and most of the systems we're talking about um, exist in, in an exception of FERPA, although there are some blurry lines here because the, um, it's basically institution data, institutional data, which is extensive on students. Um, but it also includes things like uh, learning management system data, which uh, these students interact with as they're taking classes. It, it, it can include courseware data. It can include um, C, uh, CRM data, so the tracking how the institution has been communicating with the student. It can include data on the kinds of clubs or things that the student is involved in on campus. It can include location data. Um, and it, it, it can get quite extensive. And generally speaking, colleges partner with different types of vendors uh, who help them create the algorithms with this data. So the security and privacy concerns are, are pretty extensive and the security concerns in particular, I think that there's definitely been uh, a lot of panic might be strong, but there's been a lot of concern and focus on GDPR and the recent law that went into effect in California and some of these because um, I would say higher education is not great on this. <laughs> they, ha they aren't generally the, the um, targets of hackers and things like that. When they have security breaches, they tend to be incredibly um, careless security breaches, things like storing private student data on an external hard drive that's in some locker that gets like looted. <laughs> it's things like that. So um, the amount of data that higher education has on their students is, um, is quite extensive and they don't have enough security protocols. Um, and so we actually have some and suggestions in one of our publications around things colleges should be doing, should be thinking about with securing their own data and then also securing the connections with any kind of vendor that they partner with and thinking about what the security and privacy looks like at that particular vendor. So it is absolutely a concern. Um, and unfortunately, just the federal law isn't really good enough to help guide colleges to doing a really great job. No, that's understandable. So I mean, we talked a little bit about what the cause of these problems are, right? The algorithmic bias as an issue and the idea of privacy intrusive machine learning as another concern. A lot of talk about that. When we talk about algorithms, it's said that the discrimination by algorithms is really just a reflection of discrimination already taking place in real life, right? That machines aren't inherently biased. It's the, the coding or there are some inferences being made 
as the system deploys. Uh, you know, I wanted to bring in Prince here. If you could sort of give us your thoughts on on how algorithms sort of reflect this disparity, and if you could give us specific examples as well that have been brought up in the criminal justice perspective. Sure, KJ. Um, so I, I do just want to highlight causes, and then I'll drill down on specific examples. So with risk assessment tools in particular, there are some of the causes of the disparities really are like the approach on the outset, right? So um, the fact that a risk assessment tool is being used at all shows a reductionist approach to incorporating and understanding human experience, right? You're taking um, a range of experiences of why people may not have gotten an education or why they only have one parent or why their housing situation may not be stable at one moment in time, but was always stable, right? And you're not taking account of that. Um, and you're minimizing that breadth and depth of human experience to numbers, to risk scores, to needs assessment. There's a loss of nuance and individualization there. Um, and I'll just talk about a few others before I drill down on a specific example. The second one with risk assessments is there's a monolithic understanding of the relationship between risk factors. So what does education have to do with family or community ties and what it, and as it relates to should I be free you know, before my trial? Um, and we're relying on kind of like monolithic recidivist studies that associate, oh, people like this have these problems. But um, it isn't particularized enough. And I think we just see old understandings of problems that we're learning more and more about um, that, that are not reflected in, in these tools. And misuse of the algorithmic systems in the criminal legal system at all. And one example of this is pattern. So pattern is the prisoner assessment tool targeting estimated risk and needs. Um, that's the long acronym that the Department of Justice or the Federal Bureau of Prisons uses to assess the risk of all of its prisoner population. It did so um, after the First Step Act of 2018. And uh, every person in the system has a risk score. And um, that score was based on a number of characteristics that are static and dynamic, right? One of the static factors, um, and static factors, of course, have more weight than dynamic factors. A static factor was age at first arrest. Okay, so you made a mistake when you were 16. Well, now they were using pattern just a few months ago to hierarchize who would get out of prison for the COVID-19 epidemic to depopulate prisons without any consideration of pre-existing conditions, without any um, assessment of health or prison conditions, without the idea of understanding, hey, guards might be really the ones we need to look at, not people in prison, right, who have had very limited, if any, contact with the outside world. And they used this system, right, at first to characterize and, and hierarchize who would get out of prison during a pandemic. That is not the use of this tool. We already see the problems of the use of the tool in just the context of early release, let alone using it to uh, essentially prioritize who lives and who dies in a pandemic. And so these are kind of some of the not just the issues inherent in the system, but the way they're used for other adjacent reasons, kind of, as DKG said, they become attractive nuisances that don't really solve any problems. They just make us feel good because they're objective and they give us a short answer in a lot of uncertainty. No, that's, that's helpful. And then, you know, I want to also round out this conversation about exploring the causes and the sort of the reflection of discrimination we see in real life being portrayed in these systems. Um, Iris, if you could talk about the education field and sort of a little bit more about the causes as to like why we're seeing these disparities in the system. Yeah, so two things here. One, um, we have hundreds of years of systemic bias 
uh, that have populated our campuses. And so obviously the data that they're using is going to be discriminatory, but not only that, the experience that we know um, black students in particular, but students of color in general have on campuses can be very negative. And so I liked Daniel's point about pointing these algorithms in inside. We'll talk about that with the solutions maybe, but um, using your data to try to um, have fit. And then you're noticing, for instance, that if you have a risk algorithm about students that might be at risk and how you can intervene early, you might notice that they are over identifying African American students, for instance, as being less likely to graduate. Well, that is most likely true because it's actually true across higher education. But why is that? It's because your campus is not supporting those students effectively, right? So the real solution comes um, with digging down on what's going on on your campus, what your campus climate is, and how you're supporting the students who are at risk or who are being identified as at risk. Um, so that's one of the huge things. Another weakness I will say in these um, algorithms is that they are not built for unprecedented times. Um, so in a, in a risk algorithm, for instance, um, uh, one of the things they use to see how well a student is doing and how at risk a student is, is how much they interact with the learning management system, which is the online portion of many in-person classes. Well, now that all of these have, have um, migrated to remote, all the students are using the learning management system a lot more. And so all these students who were at risk are now more and more being shown as being green or students that don't have any risk. But of course, all students are more at risk in this situation. And so we see that the, um, the data patterns that may be held up before uh, the pandemic are not holding up now. This is a particularly unprecedented time, obviously, but I will say that I think this is a risk um, across higher education with using these systems. If something happens on your campus that disrupts some of the historical patterns in the data, the output is no longer relevant. And how do you catch that before you decide that this individualized person is no longer needs your um, uh, advising support, for instance? No, that's helpful. So uh, we, I, I wanna thank panelists. You guys have done a very good job of staying with the flow problem cause we have a lot of audience members who've been asking questions about the solution they're clearly very familiar with the issues we have with these systems um, but i just want to tee up the conversation about what are possible solutions both technical procedural and just frankly from a business model perspective um, you know i have to use this opportunity to make the plug uh, once again for comprehensive privacy legislation in the u.s and we can look to the EU and see how some of the data protections in their privacy law, the GDPR, contain restrictions on automated decision making without any human involvement and on the automated processing of personal data to evaluate certain things about an individual, or as they're calling it, profiling. Now, privacy principles you know, come up when we talk about machine learning and about privacy protections, the need for transparency, companies only collecting the data they actually need for the service they're providing, and of course, use limitations. We also hear a lot about accountability and fairness. So, you know, I'm going to try to combine some of the questions that uh, audience members have been asking about. And, you know, I want to start off uh, by asking, you know, how do you manage or include racial disenfranchisement in, in these systems? And I guess, you know, I'll start with Daniel and we can kind of round robin it but is there a way essentially to to when you know there's bias that exists how do you counteract that in the actual data well again the the way that these systems are applied in society has a big factor on this right if you're using the system to try to figure out um, which police precincts are um, are uh, doing racist police like more racist policing than others I've, i'm not sure if i know a police precinct that's not doing any racist policing at all uh, but if we're looking at what, which police precincts are more racist and therefore need interventions, that's a very different application of these models than, it, than to say we're looking at this to figure out whether a specific individual should get to go home tonight instead of being kept in a cell, right? Um, so just the application alone is one, is, is one question that you need to ask. Um, you can also try to explicitly model what the level of bias is um, and uh, attempt to counteract that mathematically uh, that's a pretty difficult thing to do, and I'm not convinced that we've seen examples of that really well deployed yet. Um, uh, in particular, if you um, 
if your system is asking a very simple question, like, is this person likely to get rearrested again soon? The answer statistically may very well be uh, that African Americans are more likely to be rearrested soon, right? And if, so if your system is designed just to ask that question, you can try to account for that. But the fact is, the, the system outside, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the justice system is the problem here. Um, and so to if you want to try to adjust for that, it's very difficult to say, like, how do you do it, right? It, you needed to ask a different question than you're asking otherwise. Um, there are some techniques that people have proposed that you can use to minimize sort of individual privacy harms from large data set gatherings. Um, uh, one example of that is a sort of differential privacy approach, which says uh, we're going to make our data a little bit noisy and we're going to do that in such a way that no one individual is going to be worried that their data is going to stick out or be recoverable from this data set. We're going to make it noisy. We're going to aggregate a bunch of things together. We're only going to release the aggregated data. And so whether you participate or not, the system is going to come up with roughly the same answer anyway. It'll be slightly more accurate if you're in there, but the fact of you participating or not isn't going to be, isn't going to leak your information. But that's only one piece of the privacy harm. The other part of the privacy harm is when the system is built and it measures a discriminatory environment and then turn, you turn around and you apply that discriminatory environment to the, to the population again, people's privacy are going to be harmed in those, in those situations too. So, I mean, in, can you, and I'm glad you talked about differential privacy. I was going to talk about the sort of technical, the technological tools you can use in these situations. Um, can you speak a little bit about federated learning and any other sort of privacy enhancing technologies that can be utilized as a way to address these issues? And then, you know, I guess in that sort of same breath is can AI be used to, again, you're saying that the system is the issue that we're not asking the right question. So can AI be used to sort of counteract and separately, you know, what are some other privacy enhancing technologies? So uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data scientist, right? I, I, I am interested, I believe in the scientific method. I believe that the more information that we have, the, if we structure our use of it well, I think that's useful, right? I'm not gonna say that data cannot be used in a way that is, that is helpful. Um, but the questions that we ask, how we um, how we really, uh, th those are the those are the difficult challenges that we need to address. Um, so, federated learning is an example of a you know machine learning systems that say, hey, we don't want to learn too much about uh, we the, the the main classifier. A classifier is like a machine learning system that sorts people or things into categories doesn't want to know too much about the individuals that it's pulling training information from. So we'll have a bunch of smaller individual systems that learn some pieces of the model and then we'll aggregate those models into some uh, meta model. Again, this is useful in terms of making sure that an individual's personal data doesn't leak to the central aggregator. But if the impact of the system on the broader society is still uh, problematic, it doesn't necessarily address that kind of underlying concern. Um, I'd be curious to hear uh, Prince and Iris's perspectives on um, ways that these systems might be uh, potentially used for good. And if there's ways that we can identify um, when a system is being misused um, and explicitly call that out. I mean, I, I wanna note that if you are subject to one of these systems, sometimes you don't know that you are. Like you, a decision could be made. Uh, I was at a conference a couple of years ago where the, the title of the conference was The Computer Says No. <laughs> I'm sure we've all heard that, right? The computer says no. Well, what, what's the computer? Who made that decision? How was it done? And if you've never been subject to that, um, where a bureaucratic system sort of computer washes um, a decision that it made um, to where like, hey, sorry, like what can you do? It's objective. Um, it's a very frustrating experience. And so I wanna know if, if, if Prince and Iris see ways that we can um, empower people to push back and challenge these systems um, when they find themselves subject to them. I'll let Iris jump in first and then we can go to Prince. I appreciate that. So first of all, I, I think that the, uh, the appropriate use of these systems is really um, about augmenting human decision-making and human interaction. Um, so I will say that the reason all the training data is so biased is because people are biased. So when an individual human makes a decision inside a bureaucracy, very rarely are you able to challenge that decision effectively either. And there's probably 
not a great paper trail about why they made that decision, perhaps. So I will say that like just using these systems alone, maybe it's slightly more opaque, but I will say I think bureau bureaucracy and human decision making is definitely opaque and seriously racist and biased as well. So um, if we think about judges making like to use a very important one, like making bail decisions or things like that, we know that they're incredibly biased and horrible. And so how do you try to make those better? It's not by replacing that with a machine that's learned um, how to make that decision based on the biases of all the judges ever, right? That doesn't actually fix the problem. So to turn back to my own wheelhouse of higher ed. <laughs> um, so instead of having the professor come and tell that Latina student that she's not going to succeed in her STEM major that she wanted, you will you need to train the people on the ground who are interpreting and using this data to interact with the student in a um in a way that's supportive right so daniel exactly what you've been talking about like it you don't say no you're going to fail at this you say how can i here's i'm going to be real with you it's going to be challenging here's why here's what you need to do and here's how we can support you in doing that right so we've done a lot of work about thinking about how you can train faculty and staff to not only interpret the data, because humans are incredibly bad at probabilities. They think that 60% means it's definitely going to happen, right, which is not true. Um, so helping people interpret the data, what the signals are telling them in the data, and then also how to interact with the student themselves. So they're not um, discouraging students, right? So we know that people from different backgrounds interpret messages very differently. And if I'm a first generation college student who already feels like I don't belong somewhere because I'm not in a particularly welcoming environment due to my back or like, you know, because of my background. Um, I, if I hear a, you failed a midterm, come meet with your advisor um, message, that's going to be very discouraging to me and I may drop out. So it's all about how you message effectively, how you train the people on the front line and how you acknowledge that you can't just look at the output of these systems and say, oh, this is definitely what's going to happen and hide your own bias behind the objective data, right? Which is what we see in the interpreting of these systems a lot. I'm not even going to try to address enrollment management. So the, um, the, the admission of students and the recruitment of students into higher education, because that's got a lot more money involved. And so it's much more complicated. But I will say that those are a couple of the ways we've been trying to help colleges think about how to do this differently. Because for, for higher education, using data is very important. And this is a great resource for people to be able to use. You just have to be able to use it well, which means good training, testing the data, realizing what it's telling you and what it's not, and then interacting with students in a supportive and growth mindset sort of way. Prince, what do you think? Sure, I now have to echo DKG and Iris um, and everything that they said. Something that really sticks out um, that applies in particular to risk assessment tools. Uh, so back in 2018, the leadership conference with the coalition of about 118 other groups promulgated these principles about um, pretrial risk assessment tools. And I won't go through all of them, but there are two themes that kind of emerge that can help us tamper our expectations as Iris is talking about, about the outcome of the tools or as DKG is talking about restructure what we're using these tools for. And the first is framing is important in the criminal context to preserve the presumption of innocence of a person. So an outcome, instead of saying likelihood to recidivate, likelihood to fail, right? And when you fail, you're a failure, right? It should maybe be framed in likelihood of success, right? To comply with these issues. Um, also a recommendation, what would otherwise be a recommendation for detention should perhaps be a recommendation for um, an adversarial hearing, right, with robust constitutional rights for defendants. So instead of saying this person should be in jail, right, it's just more like, hey, we need a hearing to really talk about this individualized person's situations, um, affairs, and maybe we can come together with an, an, an outcome. And transparency, right, echoing before, defendants don't know what factors are weighted against them. So they can't defend the tools outputs. They rarely see the tools outputs before the outputs happened, happen. They, they don't know the prosecution's arguments against their pre-release until the moment. So 
they're being put at a disadvantage, defendants are, in trying to find out what this system is accounting for, why it says I can't be free or I have to be surveilled while I'm free more than other people. And just trying to fight that in a system where you're already at heightened emotion and your life is already hanging in the balance, that's too much burden on a defendant and that's unfair, right? So we need to reconsider the outcome, the outputs of these tools and, and kind of change what the outputs mean, right? And for facial recognition in particular, I, I do, I, it seems like I'm continuing to highlight the problem, but it, it's so important to know that I'd say in about 2017, Georgetown um, Center on Privacy and Technology and MIT's um, famous MIT graduate, uh, Dr. Joy Bulamwini, they first broke respective stories about racial and, gender, racial and gender bias in facial recognition. And just last December, December 2019, NIST, the National Institute for Science and Technology, reported that most of the 189 algorithms from 99 of the top developers that voluntarily submitted their algorithm to them because they thought they were great and accounted for all these different demographics. Uh, most of them falsely identified African American and Asian faces 10 to 100 times more often than Caucasian faces. That's just in December, right? So this is an ongoing process, right, that, that needs uh, accountability, political oversight, which refers to agency officials explaining their uses of the tech and receive ongoing and continuous approval, absent their abuse or overuse of these systems. We need technical oversight, right, which refers to just baseline verification and auditing standards, and that's more in the DKG wheeled house, but we believe that um, NIST, if if when they promulgate, you know, higher standards that they should be adhered to and continue to be reviewed on an ongoing process and community oversight, right? We've seen communities in the United States with the help of the ACLU um, completely ban facial recognition technology being used by law enforcement. The communities don't want them, right? They don't want their elected officials and their agencies that are supposed to be in service to them using such a, a an, an unsure technology. We've seen bans in Oakland, San Francisco, California, Somerville, Massachusetts, partly banned in Seattle. And um, we also need to listen that, you know, maybe fixing the algorithm may not necessarily be the answer. Not using it at all in certain places might be the right answer because there's, you know, there's a reason why humans, judges, sheriffs have, have made decisions and perhaps, you know, focusing on human training for these problems is, is better than machine training. Great. So we solved it all. We're done. That's good. <laughs> no, I appreciate the, the thorough breakdown, Prince. You're right. I, and I, I want to dig in a little bit more into the, the technical oversight that you spoke about. And, you know, I want to bring in Daniel here. There's, there's been conversations about the idea of auditing algorithms. And completely keeping in mind what Prince is saying, in some aspects, we shouldn't be using these systems at all. But, you know, in the context where they will be continued to be used, and we're seeing it come up in legislation, similar to Representative Clark's, I believe Representative Clark's bill talks more about impact assessments, which is more about anticipating. Um, but starting with the auditing of the algorithm first, that talks, that looks at the product, the output, what are your thoughts on if that, if that, if that is a effective measure? And then I want to hear from the other well, folks as to if those industries can actually employ that. Yeah, if if the framing of the audit is, um, as you describe it, uh, uh, in a, a context where we are going to use these systems anyway, <clears throat> then I think the audit is already starting out with one hand tied behind its back, right? Mm -hmm. An outcome of an audit needs to be able to include this system must be removed, right? Uh, because if you don't if that's just not an option, then there may, it may be an unfixable system, right? You may, the audit may reveal um, severe problems with it, whether it's problems with inaccuracy, as Prince is rightly highlighting with, with facial recognition, or problems with extreme accuracy, right? Maybe the system is perfect. I'm not sure that would be a better system than a system that's super inaccurate, right? I don't think that it's a good idea that we actually have perfect face, re perfect face recognition 
for all communities across the entire country, um, providing a centralized data source of people's locations, people's contacts, people's social graph. I don't think that's a great outcome either. So there's reasons to want, want to remove it, even if it's not inaccurate, right? So, so I, think, I think you need to be able to say, look, an audit needs to be, first off, it needs to be conducted in a context where the results of the audit have some teeth. If they don't have teeth, then you've just ended up with like, uh, you know, well, we did, the, we did the math and we found out that, yeah, we are a racist society. Next, okay, let's move on to our next agenda, right? Like that's not a solution. That's not a, that's not a helpful auditing process. So, and I think Prince was right in calling for these audits to be done in an ongoing um, basis. Um, this is particularly a concern for uh, modern software, which is routinely updated we know that software has bugs, uh, whether those bugs are the kinds of inaccuracies that Prince was pointing out or just stupid divide by zero errors, which we've actually seen in, in systems that are used in the criminal context, right? There, there are genetic assessment tools that it turned out once you got access to the source code and once you could see what they were doing, they were actually doing the math wrong, right? And some people probably went to jail because the machine said, yes, your DNA was definitely in the sample that was found on this, you know, in this particular location. Right. So, so, but then, but then the software was updated at some point and who knows whether those, those bugs were fixed. Would we even know what versions of what software were used to produce the results that are found in trials going back a decade. We don't necessarily know those things. So these audits need to be done in an ongoing basis as the software changes and as the training data changes, right. As these systems are um, uh, machine learning systems, presumably you hope that they update them with new data sets as new data become available, right? You don't want to take a sample of data from 2004 when the folks who thought of this idea, you know, designed the system and say, that's going to be our training data that we're going to use in perpetuity. As Iris pointed out, the world changes. And if your baseline data is from 2004, well, the world in 2020 looks very different. Um, and so you want the training data to be updated, but as a result, that means those audits need to also be reapplied, right? If the training data changes and all of a sudden the system is providing bad outcomes, you need to make sure you can catch that. Um, uh, who gets access to the audit, right? Who, who gets access to see it? Um, some proposals that we've seen, the audit has to be held internally by the organization that's using this so that they have access to it. And maybe you can pry it out of them in some specific contexts. In other recommendations, the audits have to be made public you have to announce what systems are, are being used. Do, this, do the people who these systems are applied to, do they even know that the systems exist, right? Or are they just told, sorry, your, your medical benefits were cut because, um, because we just have a new way of deciding it today and we're not gonna tell you what it is. So this transparency, it needs to be an ongoing thing. It needs to be visible to the people who are subject to it. And the people who are subject to it need to have the capacity to do the audit. A technical audit of a complicated system requires um, expertise and it requires time and it requires uh, actual testing. So imagine yourself, imagine that you were in a trial and the prosecutors come in and say, we have a fancy tool that we paid tens of thousands of dollars for. And we uh, took some of the evidence from the crime scene and we took some evidence from you and we turned the crank on the fancy tool and it said 98% uh, chance. Well, let's set aside what Iris's point, of, which is totally legitimate about the fact that people can't interpret probabilities. If you, had, if you were faced with a tool that said, we have a 90%, 95% confidence that you are the criminal and you know that you're not, how do you challenge that tool? What is the process? How can you do that? Who do you, you know, is your, is your public defender capable of requesting the source code and auditing to find out whether they're dividing by zero in the right place? How do we make sure that the audits are present and well-funded to make sure that the appropriate expertise is routinely available in those contexts. This is an on, going to be an ongoing social problem, and we need to we need to actually plan for that. And I know, and I appreciate that, especially the talk about the need for it to be ongoing and the need for resources and the expert, which would fund the expertise, you know, hopefully and ideally. I, with the education field, Iris, I think a lot of these conversations we talk about theoretically and, and technically, like what can be done to address a problem, but how practical is it in the higher education? I mean, you can see where I'm going, right? With the, the sort of, and we've talked about this offline, how the automated systems that higher ed is using currently aren't super advanced. And so it's now like put in resources into bringing in these experts to do this on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, how practical do you see that? And if it's not practical, like what are the challenges and hurdles that need to be overcome to sort of 
bring bring us up to speed? Yeah, so um, it's it, in higher education, the internal expertise is absolutely not in, for the most part there to do any kind of audit, even a disparate impact analysis, I would say. Um, this is a huge problem and it's a big reason why um, I put out a vendor guide that was basically colleges, this is what you need to ask your vendors before you go into contracts. Because another issue that Daniel didn't touch on is that if you sign a long-term contract with a vendor, even if it doesn't turn out the way you think it's going to, getting out of that contract is almost impossible for a governmental entity <laughs> um, who has already gone through all the procurement processes and all of these things. So you really actually need to know what you can ask the vendor to do upfront. Um, and of course, if you haven't signed a contract yet, they don't have any money, you don't have any resources to audit the, the algorithm, you don't have any resources to ensure that they can look at a disparate impact analysis. In my um, piece, I recommended that people um, guarantee, get a guarantee from the vendor that they will do a disparate impact analysis um, after they sign the contract and, and run the training data a few times. What we've seen is actually once vendors start running the data for higher education, a lot of times the output is like laughable on its face until they really do a lot of work on the data interfaces and the data definitions and all these things. And you actually actually have to work really closely with the vendor to get that right. Um, so all of this to say, creating a system where you, where the vendors of these products have to do an audit every year uh, with each college, because generally they're only using the, the college's data as their training set. So it's individualized for each college, at least that's what they say. Um, that so doing that audit every year for every um, client would be I, I would assume would be pretty would be pretty expensive and pretty hard um, and I don't think they would like that at all I agree that it's necessary and that something like that should be in place I don't know how it would work exactly in higher ed but it, I think it's a really important part of it and I I wonder if they could do I don't know this Daniel you'd have to answer this but if they could do some kind of audit of the the tool overall rather than having to do it with each client um, that might make it easier to have some kind of uh, federal rule around this and then making sure that those audits had to be public in some way which they will not want to do because they're always worried about their black box which shouldn't really be a black box um, and actually I've talked to a lot of colleges that have decided not to go with vendors because of that they won't um, disclose enough of their of their algorithm for that that um, college and particularly the faculty who deal in data science to feel comfortable with that particular system. So, uh, for Prince, are there any examples where are there jurisdictions that are actually sort of undertaking these sort of audits of their systems? And you know, if not, again, what are the same similar question to Iris? Like, what are the hurdles to implementing these type of you know audits? of these systems that pretty, you know, have a pretty detrimental impact on, on the lives of individuals. Sure. So uh, first I do want to highlight, you know, transparency is an issue as your question is suggesting KJ. Um, it took years of freedom of information act requests, you know, public records found foundational litigation to show us a clear picture of where facial recognition is being used and uh, how prevalent its use is, what systems is it using, and some of our partners have kind of really done that bean counting work jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and that should not have been the case, right, especially these agencies that serve a public utility, a public purpose, must be transparent to the public. I don't care if it's a private tool or not. So the procurement processes, right, should go into some kind of either legislative oversight or self-reporting. Um, and there, there should be some kind of, uh, there should be some kind of response, right, to if departments are found to be piloting technology or using technology that has not been previously disclosed, right, some remedy action need, needs to take place there that is also public. Um, and, you know, we are, um, agencies should also be forthright in promulgating their rules around use, right? Um, when groups did a FOIA request of the Secret Service, 
And the Secret Service revealed, yes, we're using facial recognition technology, which is no surprise. Um, and they also shared, you know, the rules that they were using internally, right, to make those decisions. And that was very helpful for us to know those should have been publicly available, right? There's, they shouldn't have to have been, been FOIA'd. And uh, another issue is some of these tools are public. I mean, public, quote unquote, when you think of uh, Clearview AI, right, which um, blockbuster story that dropped in January about this company uh, collecting over 3 billion photos from social media websites that are publicly available. And uh, kind of to DKG's point, their um, algorithm for facial recognition is very accurate, um, eerily accurate in, in many cases. And um, you know, that company has worked with over 600 law enforcement agencies in the United States, including the FBI, which the FBI itself has 20 to 30 times less images, times less images than Clearview AI, which, which is a private company. So uh, some definitely legislation um, that does few things. I mean, I've, I've kind of analyzed this and seen a continuum of four responses. Um, it either goes from straight up banning the technology, don't know how it's being used or it is being used. We don't like it. We don't know enough. The jurisdiction elects to ban it. Moratorium, and that's kind of where the leadership conference is right now saying, let's pause and study, right? Let's find out what's going on with the tech. What are the legal structures in place to provide that outside look and the guardrails? And let's stop before... Uh, we know those things. And restricted use control with controls, it's like permissive use, but as long as, kind of like the Secret Service example, like as long as you produce some kind of guardrails about it or some kind of impact assessment on a regular basis, if you self-report, this might be okay. Some jurisdictions have taken this approach. And then I haven't, I mean, the only places where I've seen the most extreme of no controls is just by happenstance, right? police departments are just adopting these, people didn't know them, and so there are no controls because no one knew it. So almost in every case where people find out this technology is being used in their jurisdictions, they lobby for some kind of control or some kind of transparency. And I really think, and me just bringing in the legal perspective, I, I really think that's the key here. Uh, some of these systems, as you said, they're not going to be stopped. They're in use, they're very attractive, um, but what is the most that we can do since they have been used and ongoing auditing and transparency and reporting and some kind of political and community oversight and involvement are ways going forward um, that we can work alongside the tech to bring about better results if that's possible, if they can't be abolished altogether. So. Yeah, and I, and I want to make clear for, I mean, our panelists and for our listeners that, you know, I tried hard to sort of not conflate how sort of commercial entities are using this data and these systems versus sort of like the government, you know, in industries that interact with government more. So, you know, education, criminal justice, and, um, you know, there are a number of other areas that we haven't even touched upon in this conversation, credit, right, fair housing, um, or other areas where these systems are having a detrimental impact and have a government perspective or government interaction. You know, with you know, we have about eight minutes left in the, the conversation. And I feel like we've been kind of harping on how artificial intelligence is, you know, the concerns with it and these systems. But is there, you know, I'm wondering if there are any sort of positive uses of artificial intelligence that can be used to address some of these issues. Um, you know, obviously, I, you know, just to sort of end it on a more optimistic note, We've talked about a lot of the concerns, the problems, and the causes, a lot of them coming from systemic issues. We've talked about the solutions, right? You need a little more human interaction. You have to reframe the actual question you're trying to get an answer to. But focusing on, you know, where we started the conversation about the role of algorithms, where can algorithms play a role in solving some of these issues? And if they can't, that's, that's a fair answer too, but I just wanted to open that up. And, um, you know, just going around the same round robin, Daniel first, Iris, and then uh, Prince. Yeah, um, so I think to the extent that an algorithm has been deployed for cost shifting purposes, as we've talked about, 
um, when people hear uh, when we're going to have to do expensive ongoing audits, that's that's too much. Well, that may just actually need to be the adjustment to your idea of what kind of cost shifting is going on here. If the audits are expensive and we need those audits in order to ensure that the algorithms that are in use are just and equitable and not privacy invasive, uh, and it turns out that it costs too much to audit, well, okay, you know, the answer might be this is not an appropriate tool for the time, right? So, so, so you know, an, if there's a data system that's in place and there is adequate auditing and testing for it, uh, and that auditing and testing is not done by proponents of the system, but it is actually potentially adversarial auditing who have access to the data there, um, and we can see that it's, you know, it's asking the question and it's applied towards society in a way that we think makes sense, right? Then, you know, those systems can be reasonable. Um, if it turns out that those systems are too, that, that it's too expensive to put the proper safeguards in place on the system, or that the folks who are offering it are private vendors and they say, oh, well, you know, this is our black box, it's our, it's our secret sauce, we can't reveal it. Again, the answer may well be, that's fine. Use your black box wherever you want to use it. But when we're using it for a system that has this public impact, it's just not appropriate. You know, we're not going to, you know, a chainsaw is really good at, at cutting through anything, but we're not going to encourage people to use chainsaws to mow the lawn in the public park. It just doesn't make sense to do that, right? Um, and so there may just be places where the technology doesn't make sense because of, because of these factors. Um, that said, like to say we're going to go cut the public park, uh, you know, grass with scissors, that also doesn't make sense, right? So there, there is some kind of balances that we can make here. Um, and it requires us to be conscious and thoughtful and not jump at every sort of salesmanship opportunity that says, hey, we can cut a bunch of costs and make it easier by making these abstractions, by making, by reducing, as Prince said, the richness of human experience into a couple of numbers, then that's an efficiency argument, right? If that efficiency argument isn't done right, it's a problem. And so we need to be wary of quests for efficiency at the cost of the social, um, the social contract that we're trying to enforce. So again, we want data. We want to know how these systems work. We want to know how our, uh, how our courts, we want to know how our education system, we want to know how our, our commerce is affecting everyone. And these systems can be used to help us learn those things if we ask the questions in the right way and we're thoughtful about it and we take the appropriate um, measures. Uh, but we, but uh, you know, if it's if it's hey, we can do this thing quick and it will let us save a bunch of money. Um, there's a, the red flag should go up immediately. Like think about who might be on the receiving end of that on the you know, and 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 the um, you know how is that going to actually end up affecting people? So I couldn't agree with Daniel more on that in particular. Um, I think actually these systems have had a lot of really positive impacts in different colleges and higher education but not because they were put in place to save money or have a quick fix. I mean, this is something that is a systemic change that has to happen in colleges. And I'm thinking particularly about early alert systems. So traditionally, advisors in higher education would just deal with people who came for, through their doors and asked for help. That was very much a self-selected group of students. Those were not necessarily the students that needed advising. And so what these systems can do when they're done well is help those advisors reach out to the students that are vulnerable, who need their help, who would not have otherwise come through their doors. And we've actually seen that in the data where if you like map how um, who advisors were seeing before the system was implemented and who advisors were seeing after the system was implemented and how that overlaid with risk scores, it actually has a huge impact on students that are vulnerable in higher education and really it behooves the college to act on the data that they have to support the students that they've admitted to get to graduation because when you drop out with debt you're in really big trouble and you're going to do better if you end up graduating so in that way it's had a really positive impact that is not universal um, because as Daniel was saying, that can be seen as like a cost savings, like you're somehow going to reallocate the same advisors to new students and that's going to save you money and time and all these things. That's not how this ends up working out. The ones that have done this, the schools that have done this well, have hired a ton more advisors, have been much more intrusive about helping, and have really had a systemic change all the way through their college to make a big difference. The most famous example of this is Georgia State University, where they've managed to uh, make increase their graduation rate significantly over 10 years and close the gap between black and white students um, for graduation and with Pell eligible, so low income students and people who are not Pell eligible. So it's a huge success story. 
but they've done a ton more than implement these systems. This is just one piece of their strategy that's been well informed for that. So um, I think in higher ed, it can be done well. And when it is done well, it's incredibly powerful and can be a force for um, real change and, and, and help like our society really. Uh, but that is by no means guaranteed. <laughs> and I will say Georgia State is probably the exception in the way that they've implemented this. In a lot of cases, it's just, we are gonna purchase a product, we're gonna put it, we're just gonna like put it out there and it's gonna fix everything and that's not how it works, so. Um, I hate to be that person on the panel, but I am gonna say uh, in the criminal justice context, as we're seeing outside of our windows on the news every night and in over 4,400 jurisdictions in the last week. Um, there is so much structural inequity in the criminal justice system. Uh, I highly recommend that tools not be used right now, if ever at all. Um, the cost of an algorithm, mis you know, facial recognition system misidentifying you or, um, you know, a, a bail hearing kind of uh, a risk assessment tool keeping you in jail when you're really low risk. You could lose your job. You could lose your standing in the community. You could lose your life. You could lose a whole lot of things. So to just put a algorithm on top of it and say, oh, we'll fix it over time with like a little bit of transparency and a little bit of like this and a little bit of that the harm that is done to human beings along the way is irreparable, right? And in, in that context, you know, as a leadership conference, we're, we're taking account of um, all of those harms that we've seen being done to people of color for centuries, let alone decades, let alone right now. And right now is not the time to be introducing these tools, um, these algorithms into the criminal justice system. Oh, I appreciate the diversity of perspectives. And, and I think where we're coming from, especially if we're looking at a certain industry, I think all these points make a lot of sense. So with that, I want to close. I want to thank our panelists so much for giving us their time. I want to thank the, the events and the communications team at OTI and New America for helping us put this together today. And uh, thank you to our uh, attendees who gave us some of their afternoon to listen to this conversation. Thanks everyone.